Hey everyone, this video is going to be the start of a new series on blueprint visual scripting inside of Unreal Engine 4 and 5. It's pretty much the same system in both of them, there aren't really any changes that Unreal Engine 5 does to the scripting system in Unreal Engine 4, so everything I do in this series will apply to both of them. Now, this series is going to be meant for someone who's just starting out with Unreal Engine, who's trying to learn blueprint visual scripting, and I'm going to be presenting information with that in mind. However, if you have been using blueprints for a little while, but you are really trying to figure out the best practices, these videos are probably going to be worth a watch for you too, because that is something I'm also going to cover in this series. I don't want to teach you just how to use blueprints. I want to teach you how to use them effectively and well. So let's begin. I have a digital uh, whiteboard app here pulled up on my tablet. And before we hop into the engine and start learning things, I wanted to go over some of the fundamental concepts of object-oriented programming. First off, what is it? Well, object-oriented programming is a computer programming model based on the concept of objects, which contain data and or code. It's simple, but extremely powerful and extremely useful when it comes to video games. C++ is an object-oriented programming language, so is Java, Python, the list goes on. But blueprints are also object-oriented because they're built on a game engine using an object-oriented programming language. So the four pillars of object-oriented programming apply to blueprints as well as any object-oriented programming language. And these four pillars are in no specific order. One encapsulation. Don't mind my odd end there. Two, abstraction. Three, inheritance. And four, finally, okay, and four, polymorphism. These four pillars are the foundational concepts underlying object-oriented programming, and following them where they're applicable is going to lead you to having better code. So, encapsulation, our first one. Let's erase this off here. Our first pillar that we're going to cover refers to taking the data that you are using and any code that manipulates it and storing this data and the code that manipulates it inside of an object is the best practice. It is the thing you should be doing most of the time unless you have a reason not to. Let's say we have a character and it's an object, it's our player character and he has a health bar with 100 hit points. And we have the data, 100 hit points. Let's say we make some code to manipulate that data, to add points on, to subtract points away whenever you're using, let's say, a healing potion or you get hit by an enemy's sword. Well, all that code related to the data about health which describes something about an object, which is a player character, should be stored inside the object, the digital object of the player character. It just keeps things organized and easy to understand for you and for everyone involved in a project. As time goes on and projects get bigger, having things organized like this really, really helps. And it also can lead to more easy optimization. Next, we have Next, we have abstraction. So abstraction is just the act or the idea of separating function from implementation. The players playing your game, designers or other developers that you're working on a game with, 
they don't need to know all the underlying code of everything you do. If they're a designer using the code, they only need to know what values they need to put in to get values out. If they're a player, well, they certainly don't need to see all the underlying code. They just need to be able to interact with your game through their input device and see the results from that. And that's really all that abstraction is. If a designer wants to modify the health of a character or they want to write some code to affect the health of the character, they don't need to see the math that adds and subtracts to or from health. They just need to be able to input a number and trust that health has been updated and that number has been added or subtracted based on whether or not it was positive or negative. And that's a relatively simple process, but abstraction still applies. What you do in that situation is you take the code that modifies health, let's pretend it's all this here, and you would wrap it up into a function. In this case, the code is uh, a graph of nodes. We collapse it into a single node here that is a function, and you can place it anywhere in a blueprint graph. Again, I'm trying to do an overview without being in the engine, without just on some of the fundamentals. So this can be applied to the nodes, and it'll make more sense as I cover each of these in its own video once I've gone over the UI and how to use the blueprint graph in the engine. If you don't understand absolutely everything here, you don't need to. Again, this is an overview, something you're able to come back, reference later, but to give you a good starting point for learning the blueprint scripting system with best practices in mind. So we have our code to modify the health collapsed into its own function, its own node. 10 lines of code, if it's C++, could be collapsed into one line of code where you're calling a function with those 10 lines of code inside of it. The same thing applies to blueprints. 10 nodes collapse into a single node, and you're using that node in place of the 10 nodes. And you can have an input for a function, and you can have an output for a function. They're not required, but they can be there. In this case, we could input negative one, and so the function subtracts one and updates health. Maybe it doesn't have an output, it just updates it, or it outputs 99 from the current health, and you could then update the health over here. There's different ways to do things. That's a cool thing about code, whether it's C++ or Blueprints, is that there's really a million different ways to attack any issue, any problem, and it can be a really fun thing to do. Doesn't mean all those ways are the best ways, and that's something I want to cover in this series. Best practices. And that really is abstraction. Hiding the inner workings of your complex code that don't need to be understood by other designers and players and just giving them what they do need to get the results of your code, to use your code. That's it. That's abstraction. Next we have inheritance. Next up we have inheritance. In C++ with the blueprint system and various object-oriented programming languages, you have classes. A class is just a type of object with inheritance. Okay, so let's say our game has a character, a player character, but it also has NPCs who are friendly, enemies who try to attack the character, but they're all going to share some similarities, some things in common. They can all move around in the same way or extremely similar ways. They all might have a health bar with health points. They all might be able to interact with doors or containers. But there's going to be lots of things that are different too. The AI that the NPCs or enemies that attack the player is going to be very different than the AI of the NPCs that just stand around and trade items with the player. And so, well, do we just recode everything? Even if we just have to copy and paste large sections from our character to our uh, to our merchant NPCs to our enemies you could do it that way but there's a better easier way and that is making use of inheritance a type of object in C++ and with the blueprint visual scripting is a class it's something that Unreal Engine is built around the concept Unreal Engine is built around so you can have a character class this stick figure will represent it. And a class can be a child, 
or it can be a parent. Which is a way of saying we can have classes that inherit from this main character class. And this parent class can contain all the code that all of these classes share. The code for opening doors, accessing containers, having health, and being able to die in the game. So now you don't have to rewrite all your code for any for every type of character just because of the different types of differences. But what about those differences? If they're inheriting, how do we make them unique? How do we make sure that enemies are using a different AI tree, decision-making tree, and that they're attacking the player? Well, that brings us to the fourth pillar, polymorphism. And it is a super important concept to understand. Polymorphism means that child classes can override the functions of their parent class. It can mean they can have their own code. It means they can take the code from a parent and change it, modify it, and still be a child of the parent class of object. We can have characters that move at different rates. It really applies to everything. Different movement speeds, different ways of handling health. You can just override and change the child variables, functions, and just start from the parent as a base. You can add base functions to the parent and they'll become available in the child class. Even if you changed other functions, other pieces of code inside of the child class. Let's try visualizing it. So we have a parent class. It's a box. It's an object. We'll make it a box. And it has some items in it. Let's say it has four of these items. These are all functions. And we have a child class, which inherits from the parent class. And we want three of the parent's functions exactly how they are. I think the child class of object does something a bit different. So we override that fourth function and make the changes we need. And it's still a child. If we add a fifth function into the parent class, that fifth function is added to the child class, even though we've made changes. And that is polymorphism, and those are the four pillars of object-oriented programming. They're some of the underlying fun fundamentals behind it. They really describe what it is and what makes it different than other types of programming. And next, we will cover the basics of the user interface of the engine, of how to create blueprints, how to add nodes, how to navigate through the different windows, and then we'll move on to the fundamentals such as variables, functions, and we'll start to actively make use of these four pillars of object-oriented programming throughout our structure, throughout our pieces of code. And hopefully it'll all begin to start coming together and making more sense. But before we could do that, I wanted to cover this as basically as I could without leaving any of the important details out and so if you found this video useful if it was helpful if you've learned something from it be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel because more videos are coming and things will get more exciting and the next video we are going to go into the engine and we're going to start making things and taking these practices these pillars of object-oriented programming and we're going to start implementing them and using them i think it's going to be a whole lot of fun so I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you for watching.